chapter three of Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets. This chapter is called The Burrow. I hope that you guys enjoy. The Burrow. Ron, breathed Harry, creeping to the window and pushing it up so they could talk through the bars. Ron, how did you? What the? Harry's mouth fell open as the full impact of what he was seeing hit him. Ron was leaning out of the back window of an old turquoise car which was parked in mid-air. Grinning at Harry from the front seats were Fred and George, Ron's elder twin brothers. All right, Harry, asked George. What's been going on, said Ron. Why haven't you been answering my letters? I've asked you to stay about 12 times and then dad came home and said you'd got an official warning for using magic in front of muggles. It wasn't me and how did he know he works for the ministry said ron you know we're not supposed to do spells outside school you should talk said harry staring at the floating car oh this doesn't count said ron we're only borrowing this it's dad's we didn't enchant it but doing magic in front of those muggles you live with i told you i didn't but it'll take too long to explain now look can you tell them at hogwarts that the dursleys have locked me up and won't let me come back and obviously i can't magic myself out because the ministry will think that's the second spell i've done in three days so stop gibbering said ron we've come to take you home with us but you can't magic me out either we don't need to said ron jerking his head toward the front seat and grinning you forget who i've got with me tie that around the bar said fred throwing the end of a rope to harry if the dursies wake up i'm dead said harry as he tied the rope tightly around a bar and fred revved up the car don't worry said fred stand back harry moved back into the shadows next to hedwig who seemed to have realized how important this was and kept still and silent the car revved louder and louder and suddenly with a crunching noise the bars were pulled clean out of the window as fred and as fred drove straight up in the air Harry ran back to the window to see the bars dangling a few feet above the ground. Panting, Ron hoisted them up into the car. Harry listened anxiously, but there was no sound from the Dursley's bedroom. When the bars were safely in the back seat with Ron, Fred reversed as close as possible to Harry's window. Get in, Ron said. But all my Hogwarts stuff, my wand, my broomstick, where is it? Locked in the cupboard under the stairs, and I can't get out of this room. No problem, said George from the front passenger seat. Out of the way, Harry. Fred and George climbed cat-like through the window into Harry's room. You had to hand it to them, thought Harry, as George took an ordinary hairpin from his pocket and started to pick the lock. A lot of wizards think it's a waste of time knowing this sort of muggle trick, said Fred, but we feel their, sk their skills worth learning, even if they are a bit slow. There was a small click and the door swung open. So, we'll get your trunk. You grab anything you need from your room and hand it out to Ron, whispered George. Watch out for the bottom stair. It creaks, Harry whispered back as the twins disappeared into the dark landing. Harry dashed around his room, collecting his things and passing them out of the window to Ron. Then he went to help Fred and George heave his trunk up the stairs. Harry heard Uncle Vernon cough. At last, panting, they reached the landing then carried the trunk through Harry's room to the open window. Fred climbed back into the car to pull with Ron and Harry and George pushed from the bedroom side. Inch by inch, the trunk slid through the window. Uncle Vernon coughed again. A bit more panted fred who was pulling from inside the car one good push harry and george threw their shoulders against the trunk and it slid out of the window into the back seat of the car okay let's go george whispered but as harry climbed into the window sill, there came a sudden loud screech from behind him that followed immediately by the thunder of uncle vernon's voice that ruddy owl I've forgotten Hedwig. Harry tore back across the room as a landing light clicked on. He snatched up Hedwig's cage, dashed to the window, and then passed it to Ron. He was scrambling back onto the chest of drawers when Uncle Vernon hammered on the unlocked door, and it crashed open. For a split second, Uncle Vernon stood framed in the doorway. Then he let out a bellow like an angry bull and dived at Harry, grabbing him by the ankle. Ron, Fred, and George seized Harry's arms and pulled as hard as they could. Petunia, roared Uncle Vernon. He's getting away, he's getting away. But the Wheezies gave a gigantic tug and Harry's legs slid out of Uncle Vernon's grasp. Harry was in the car. He'd slammed the door shut. Put your foot down, Fred, yelled Ron, and the car shut suddenly toward the moon. Harry couldn't believe it. He was free. He rolled down the window, the night air whipping his hair, and looked back at the shrinking rooftops of Privet Drive. Uncle Vernon and Petunia and Dudley were all hanging drum dumbstruck out of Harry's window. See you next summer, Harry yelled. The Wheezies roared with laughter, and Harry settled back in his seat, grinning from ear to ear. Let Hedwig out, he told Ron. She can fly behind us. She hasn't had a chance to stretch her wings for ages. George handed a hairpin to Ron, and a moment later, Hedwig soared joyfully out of the window to glide alongside them like a ghost. So, what's the story, Harry? said Ron impatiently. What's been happening? Harry told them all about Dobby, the warning he'd given Harry, and the fiasco of the violet pudding. There was a long, shock silence when he had finished. Very fishy, said Ron finally. Definitely dodgy, agreed George. So, he wouldn't even tell you who's supposed to be plotting all this stuff? I don't think he could said harry i told you every time he got close to letting something slip he started banging his head against the wall he saw fred and george look at each other 
What, you think he was lying to me, said Harry? Well, said Fred, put it this way. Hells elves have got powerful magic of their own, but they can't usually use it without their master's permission. I reckon old Dobby was sent to stop you coming back to Hogwarts. Someone's idea of a joke. Can you think of anyone at school with a grudge against you? Yes, said Harry and Ron together instantly. Draco Malfoy, Harry explained. He hates me. Draco Malfoy, said George, turning around. Not Lucius Malfoy's son. Must be. It's not a very common name, is it, said Harry. I've heard dad talking about him, said George. She was a big supporter of you know who and when you know who disappeared said fred craning around to look at harry lucius malfoy came back saying he never meant any of it a load of dung dad reckons he was right in you know who's inner circle harry had heard these rumors about malfoy's family before and they didn't surprise him at all Malfoy made Dudley Dursley look like a kind, thoughtful, and sensitive boy. I don't know whether the Malfoys own a house elf, said Harry. Well, whoever owns him will be in an old wizarding family and they'll be rich, said Fred. Yeah, Mom's always wishing we had a house elf to do the ironing, said George. But all we've got is a lousy old goal in the attic and gnomes all over the garden. House elves come with big old manors and castles and places like that. You wouldn't catch one in our house. Harry was silent, judging by the fact that Draco Malfoy usually had the best of everything. His family was rolling in wizard gold. He could just see Malfoy strutting around a large manor house, sending the family servant to stop Harry from going back to Hogwarts. Also sounded exactly like the sort of thing Malfoy would do. Had Harry been so stupid to take Dobby seriously? I'm glad we came back to get you anyway, said Ron. I was getting really worried when you didn't answer any of my letters. I thought it was Errol's fault at first. Who's Errol? Our owl. He's ancient. It wouldn't be the first time he collapsed on a delivery. So then I tried to borrow armies. Who? The owl mum and dad bought Percy when he was made prefect, said Fred from the front. But Percy wouldn't lend him to me, said Ron. Said he needed him. Percy's been acting very oddly this summer, said George, frowning, and he has been sending a lot of letters and spending a load of time shut up in his room. I mean, there's only so many times you can polish a prefect badge. You're driving too far west, Fred, he added, pointing at a compass on the dashboard. Fred twiddled the steering wheel. So does your dad know you've got the car, said Harry, guessing the answer. Er, no, said Ron. He had to work tonight. Hopefully we'll be able to get it back in the garage without Mum noticing we flew it. What does your dad do at the Ministry of Magic anyway? He works in the most boring department, said Ron. The misuse of Muggle Artifacts Office. The what? It's all to do with bewitching things that are muggle made. You know, in case they end up back in the muggle shop or house, like last year some old witch died and her tea set was sold to an antique shop. This muggle woman bought it, took it home, and tried to serve her friend's tea in it. It was a nightmare. Dad was working overtime for weeks. What happened? The teapot went berserk and squirted boiling tea all over the place, and one man ended up in the hospital with sugar tongs clamped to his nose. Dad was going frantic. It's only him and an old warlock called Perkins in the office, and they had to do memory charms and all sorts of stuff to cover it up. But your dad, this car, Fred laughed. Yeah, dad's crazy about everything to do with muggles. Our shed's full of muggle stuff. He takes it apart, puts spells on it, and puts it back together again. If he raided our house, he'd have to put himself under arrest. It, drive, it drives mom mad. That's the main road, said George, peering down through the windshield. We'll be there in ten minutes, just as well. It's getting light. A faint pinkish glow was visible along the horizon to the east. Fred brought the car lower, and Harry saw a dark patchwork patchwork of fields and clumps of trees we're a little way outside the village said george ottery saint catchpole lower and lower went the flying car the edge of a brilliant red sun was now gleaming through the trees touchdowns at fred with a slight bump they hit the ground they had landed next to a tumble down garage in a small yard and harry looked out for the first time at ron's house it looked as though it had once been a large stone pig pen but extra rooms had been added here and there until it was several stories high and so crooked it looked as though it were held up by magic which harry reminded himself it probably was four or five chimneys were perched on top of the red roof a lopsided sign stuck in the ground near the entrance read the burrow around the front door lay a jumble of rubber boots and very rusty cauldron several fat brown chickens were pecking their way around the yard it's not much said ron it's wonderful said harry happily thinking of privet drive they got out of the car now we'll go upstairs really quietly said fred and wait for mum to call us for breakfast then ron you come bounding downstairs going mum look who turned up in the night and she'll be all pleased to see harry and no one ever needs to know we flew the car right said ron come on harry i sleep at the at the top ron had gone a nasty greenish color his eyes fixed on the house the other three wheeled around mrs weasley was marching across the yard scattering chickens and for a short plum kind-faced woman it was remarkable how much she looked like a saber-toothed tiger ah said fred oh dear said george mrs weasley came to a halt in front of them her hands on her hips staring from one guilty face to the next she was wearing a flowered apron with a wand sticking out of the pocket so she said 
morning, mum, said George in what he clearly thought was a jaunty, winning voice. Have you any idea how worried I've been, said Mrs. Weasley in a deadly whisper. Sorry, mum, but, but see, we had to... All three of Mrs. Weasley's sons were taller than she was, but they cowered as her rage broke over them. Bed's empty, no note car gone, could have crashed out of my mind with worry. Did you care? Never, as long as I've lived. You wait until your father gets home. We never had trouble like this from Bill or Charlie or Percy. Perfect Percy, muttered Fred. You could do with taking a leaf out of Percy's book, yelled Mrs. Weasley, prodding a finger in Fred's chest. You could have died. You could have been seen. You could have lost your father, his job. It seemed to go on for hours. Mrs. Weasley had shouted herself hoarse before she turned on Harry, who backed away. I'm very pleased to see you, Harry, dear, she said. Come in and have breakfast. She turned and walked back into the house and Harry, after a nervous glance at Ron, who nodded encouragingly, followed her. The kitchen was small and rather cramped. There was a scrubbed wooden table and chairs in the middle and Harry sat down on the edge of his seat looking around. He had never been in a wizard house before. The clock on the wall opposite him had only one hand with no numbers on it at all. Written around the edge were things like time to make tea, time to feed the chickens, and you're late. Books were stacked three deep on the mantelpiece. Books with titles like charm, your own cheese, enchantment and baking, and one minute feast, it's magic. And unless Harry's ears were deceiving him, the old radio next to the sink had just announced that coming up was witching hour with the popular singing sorceress Celestina Warbeck. Mrs. Weasley was clattering around cooking breakfast a little hazardly, throwing dirty looks at her sons as she threw sausages into the frying pan. Every now and then she muttered things like, don't know what we were thinking of and never would have believed it. I don't blame you, dear, she assured Harry, tipping eight or nine sausages onto his plate. Arthur and I have been worried about you, too. Just last night, we were saying we'd come and get you ourselves if you hadn't run back to Ron by Friday. But really, she was now adding three fried eggs to his plate. Flying in a legal car halfway across the country, anyone could have seen you. She flicked her wand casually at the dishes in the sink, which began to clean themselves, clinking gently in the background. It was cloudy, Mom, said Fred. You keep your mouth closed while you're eating, Mrs. Weasley snapped. They were starving him, Mom, said George. And you, said Mrs. Weasley, but it was with a slightly softened expression that she started cutting Harry bread and buttering it for him. At that moment, there was a diversion in the form of a small red-headed figure in a long nightdress who appeared in the kitchen, give, gave a small squeal, and ran out again. Ginny, said Ron in an undertone to Harry, my sister, she's been talking about you all summer. Yeah, she'll be wanting your autograph, Harry, Fred said with a grin, but he caught his mother's eye and bent his face over his plate without another word. Nothing more was said until all four plates were clean, which took a surprisingly short time. Blimey, I'm tired, yawned Fred, setting down his knife and fork at last. I think I'll go to bed and you will not, snapped Mrs. Weasley. It's your own fault you've been up all night. You're going to denome the garden for me. They're getting completely out of hand again. Oh, mum, and you too, she said, glaring at Ron and Fred. You can go to bed, dear, she added to Harry. You didn't ask them to fly that wretched car. But Harry, who felt wide awake, said quickly, I'll help Ron. I've never seen a denoming. That's very sweet of you, dear, but it's dull work, said Mrs. Weasley. Now let's see what Lockhart's got to say on the subject. And she pulled a heavy book from the stack on the mantelpiece. George groaned. Mom, we know how to denome a garden. Harry looked at the cover of Mrs. Weasley's book, written across it in fancy gold letters with the words, Gilderoy Lockhart's Guide to Household Pests. There was a big photograph on the front of a very good-looking wizard with wavy blonde hair and bright blue eyes. As always, in the wizarding world, the photograph was moving. The wizard, who Harry supposed was Gilderoy Lock Lockhart, kept winking cheekily up at them. Mrs. Weasley beamed down at him. Oh, he is marvelous, she said. He knows his household pests all right. It's a wonderful book. Mum fancies him, said Fred in a very audible whisper. Don't be so ridiculous, Fred, said Mrs. Weasley, her cheeks rather pink. All right, if you think you know better than Lockhart, you can go and get on with it, and woe be tied you if there's a single gnome in that garden when I come out to inspect it. Yawning and grumbling, the Weasleys slouched outside with Harry behind them. The garden was large and in Harry's eyes exactly what a garden should be. The Dursleys wouldn't have liked it. There were plenty of weeds and the grass needed cutting, but there were gnarled trees all around the walls. Plants Harry had never seen spilling from every flower bed in a big green pond full of frog. There was a violent scuffling noise. The peony bus shuddered and Ron straightened up. This is a gnome, he said grimly. Get off me, get off me, squealed the gnome. It was certainly nothing like Santa Claus. It was small and leathery looking with a large knobby bald head exactly like a potato. Ron held it at arm's length as it kicked out with, at him with its horny little feet. He grasped it around its ankles and turned it upside down. This is what you have to do, he said. He raised the gnome above his head. Get off me and started to swing it in 
great circles like a lasso. Seeing the shocked look on Harry's face, Ron added, it doesn't hurt them. You've got to make them really dizzy so they can't find their way back to the gnome holes. He let go of the gnome's ankles. It flew 20 feet in the air and landed with a thud in the field over the hedge. Pitiful, said Fred. I bet I can get mine beyond that stump. Harry learned quickly not to feel too sorry for the gnomes. He decided just to drop the first one he caught over the hedge, but the gnome, sensing weakness, sank its razor sharp sharp teeth into Harry's finger and he had a hard job shaking it off until, wow, Harry, that must have been 50 feet. The air was soon thick with flying gnomes. See, they're not too bright, said George, seizing five or six gnomes, six gnomes at once. The moment they knew the genomings going on, they storm up to have a look. You'd think they have learned by now just to stay put. Soon the crowd of gnomes in the field started walking away in a straggling line, their little shoulders hunched. They'll be back, said Ron, as they watched the gnomes disappear into the hedge on the other side of the field. They love it here. Dad's too soft with them. He thinks they're funny. Just then the front door slammed. He's back, said George. Dad's home. They hurried through the garden and back into the house mrs mr weasley was slumped in a kitchen chair with his glasses off and his eyes closed he was a thin man going bald but the little hair he had was as red as any of his children's he was wearing long green robes which were dusty and travel worn what a night he mumbled groping for the teapot as they all saw, sat down around him nine raids nine and old mundugus fletcher tried to put a hex on me when i had my back turned mr weasley took a long gulp of tea inside find anything dad said fred eagerly all i got there were a few shrinking door keys and a bit biting kettle yawned mr weasley there was some pretty nasty stuff that wasn't in my department though mortlake was taken away for questioning about some extremely odd ferrets, but that's the committee on experimental charms thank goodness why would anyone bother making door keys shrink said george just smuggle baiting sighed mr weasley sell them a key that that keeps shrinking to nothing so they can never find it when they need it of course it's very hard to convict anyone because no muggle would admit their keys keep shrinking they'll insist they just keep losing it bless them they'll go to any links to ignore magic even if it's staring them in the face but the things our lot have taken to enchanting you wouldn't believe like cars for instance mrs weasley had appeared holding a long poker like a sword mr weasley's eyes jerked open he stared guiltily at his wife C cars molly dear yes arthur cars said mrs weasley her eyes flashing imagine a wizard buying a rusty old car and telling his wife all he wanted to do with it was take it apart to see how it worked while really he was enchanting it to make it fly mr weasley blinked well dear i think you'll find that he would be quite within the law to do that even if or he maybe would have done it better to um tell his wife the truth there's a loophole in the law you'll find as long as he wasn't intending to fly the car the fact that the car could fly wouldn't arthur we Weasley, you made sure there was a loophole when you wrote that law, shouted Mrs. Weasley, just so you could carry on tinkering with all that muggle rubbish in your shed. And for your information, Harry arrived this morning in the car you weren't intending to fly. Harry, said Mr. Weasley blankly. Harry who? He looked around, saw Harry, and jumped. Good Lord, is it Harry Potter? Very pleased to meet you. Ron's told us so much about your sons flew that car to Harry's house and back last night, shouted Mrs. Weasley. What have you got to say about that, eh? Did you really? said Mr. Weasley eagerly. Did it all did it go all right? I I mean, he faltered as sparks flew from Mrs. Weasley's eyes. That that was very wrong, boys. Very wrong indeed. Let's leave them to it, Ron muttered to Harry as Mrs. Weasley swelled like a bullfrog come on i'll show you my bedroom they slipped out of the kitchen and down down a narrow passageway to an uneven staircase which wound its way zigzagging up to the house on the third landing a door stood ajar harry just caught sight of a pout of a pair of bright brown eyes staring at him before it closed with a snap jinny said ron you don't know how weird it is for her to be this shy she never shuts up normally they climbed two more flights until they reached a door with peeling paint and a small plaque on it saying ronald's room harry stepped in his head almost touching the sloping ceiling and blinked it was like walking into a furnace nearly everything in ron's room seemed to be a violent shade of orange the bedspread the walls even the ceiling then harry realized that ron had covered nearly every inch of the shabby wallpaper with posters of the same seven witches and wizards all wearing bright orange robes carrying broomsticks and waving energetically your quidditch team said harry the chudley cannon said ron pointing at the orange bedspread which was em emblazoned with two giant black seas and a speeding cannonball ninth in the league ron's school books were stacked untidily in a corner next to a pile of comics that all seemed to feature the adventures of martin mix the mad muggle 
Ron's magic wand was lying on top of a fish tank full of frog spawn on the windowsill next to its fat gray rat scabbers, who was snoozing in a patch of sun. Harry stepped over a pack of self-shuffling playing cards on the floor and looked out of the tiny window. In the field far below, he could see a gang of gnomes sneaking one by one through the Weasley's hedge. Then he turned to look at Ron, who was watching him almost nervously as though waiting for his opinion. It's a bit small, said Ron quickly, not like the room you had with the muggles, and I'm right underneath the goal in the attic. He's always banging on the pipes and groaning. But Harry, grinning wildly, said, This is the best house I've ever been in. Ron's ears went pink. So members, that was chapter three of Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets. I'm going to read off three comprehension questions and please answer them if you can. Question number one. How did Harry become free from his room and the Dursleys? Question number two. Why did they think Draco Malfoy could have sent the house elf to Harry? And question number three. How did the boys get rid of the gnomes? So members, I hope that you guys enjoyed and that you guys stay tuned for the next chapter. Bye!